Friday, everybody. Nick Slavic here, proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company, also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades of experience as a business owner and a craftsperson to answer questions. And if I don't have the answers, the people associated with this show do. It's an amazing community of some of the finest business owners and craftspeople in the world. I'm in northern Minnesota today at the Wilderness. Um, I had a very interesting question come from the PCA, which is um, the contractor question of the week. Um, what is your preferred new construction coating schedule? And I thought this is a perfect time to go through that. Interesting place to be to talk about new construction, but for those of you who have followed along uh, the last couple of years of Ask a Painter and my social media feed, you know that I completed a project called the Hashtag Cottage Cabin Project. If you search the Hashtag Cottage Cabin, you can see updates of uh, a wilderness um, a wilderness cabin uh, I completed a few years ago. Now, it is new construction. I am here in this beautiful wilderness, crystal clear ponds, lakes, things like this. I know it's an odd place to talk about new construction, but I'm gonna walk you through this house. So the cottage cabin project was a very unique collaboration. I have some of the best clients in the world that were going to build a wilderness cabin for themselves, and they wanted to build it brand new, but they wanted it styled after a 1920s lake cottage in Northern Minnesota, the wilderness of the upper Midwest. So they did just that. Now, these clients are very aesthetically minded. How things look, uh, matter greatly to them. The interesting thing about these clients is they also care how things feel, how things last, and they care about quality. So interesting collaboration. They're very aesthetically minded. They told me what it wanted to look like, and they allowed me to spec every bit of the coatings for this. So what you're seeing here is a brand new constructed wilderness cabin uh, in northern Minnesota. Um, the idea of this whole thing is the client is very aesthetically minded, very handy, chopped down his own trees, milled his own wood, and then built this thing. Construction lumber obviously was sourced for construction lumber, but what you're seeing on the outside of this house is hand split solid oak shakes. I've never seen this on another house before. This client cares about things lasting. Most of the time these shakes are pine or cedar. These are oak, and I'll show you how it's been looking. I'm gonna walk you through my entire coating schedule for this project when we sit down and get inside. But first I'm gonna show you how these have held up. It's been a bunch of years since I've been up here doing this. Screened in porch we did, I'll, I'll show you that last before we go in. Solid, <laughs> solid oak shakes on the outside of this house. We applied two coats of duckback premium translucent satin to it. And honestly, these, these are the things that I worried the most about because Northern Minnesota, it can go negative 40, it can go 100 degrees in the summer rain, snow, all sorts of stuff. These things look as perfect as the day we left when we put on this finish. It's still got its satin shine. None of the stuff is grayed. None of the coating has failed. None of it's delaminated. Absolutely amazing. Uh, couldn't recommend that enough. Um, the general idea of this project was, if I had my way, and this were my own house, these clients allowed me to spec things out like it was my own house. And I just said, you know, going through Sherwin-Williams catalog, what is the best we can use? Now, interestingly enough, best does not always mean most expensive. Best means the best. So as a craftsperson, I've walked up and down uh, the, the catalog in Sherwin-Williams and some stuff is sneaky. And I'm gonna show you a couple of those sneaky things. I've actually listed them all, uh, all below, but I'll show you some here. This has held up insanely well insanely well. I couldn't be more pleased with this. I expected areas, oop, I expected areas like down below where the water bounces back to start showing some eye, uh, signs of failing or age. It has not. Um, amazingly, when you get water coming off a roof like this and landing on the ground, you would expect it to fail a little bit. Absolutely not. Likewise, with a shed dormer up there, you have you know, water hitting shingles, splashing back, getting between and behind the shake sometimes. Nothing. It is amazing. I couldn't be more pleased with that product. Take you around this side here. I'll show you a little. Yeah, look at that. Absolutely beautiful. I could not be more pleased with that. Dominic Crowley agreed. So, this project has everything that I love. We are in the wilderness of Northern Minnesota, one of the most beautiful places on this planet. We're doing new construction, so we can do whatever we want, and we're doing something that's sort of historical, but in premium. So if you follow the hashtag Cottage Cabin, you'll see I actually slept down by this lake 
uh, while we were finishing. There were bear sightings, critters running around. The last time I was up here with some of my craftspeople, there was actually an escaped, uh, an escaped convict who had been breaking into houses. And only after I was up here, I found out that he was actually wandering around this area here. So again, I didn't know it, but uh, unique circumstances with this job. So I'll take you guys inside now. So again, duckback premium translucent here. Couldn't be more pleased. I should say this though. I can make really crappy materials and substrates look pretty good and last pretty long. But when you're given a premium substrate like this, <laughs> the finishes are so much better. They last so much longer. It's an amazing thing. When you combine those two things, that's where you get like those 10 to 20 year finishes that look beautiful, feel beautiful, and last. So you can see screen addition here that the client built. We used uh, super deck semi-transparent on here. The only thing I would have done different is probably would have continued the duckback translucent on this stuff. Um, the only downside of using like that, that film forming satin stuff on this, if you don't coat like these screen structures like this on all sides, sometimes water can get behind it and it might get cloudy and stuff. Uh, this stuff is held up insanely well. Uh, one coat basically uh, a couple years ago hasn't turned gray, it's protected well. I think I will recommend to the clients that we move to the duckback satin going forward to give them a nice long lasting finish, especially because they're not up here all the time. All right, let's go on in. So you can see, and this is why I love these clients, they made all this beadboard. It is insane. They milled all this, they cut down the trees, milled all this, installed it, and I had, uh, I had the pleasure of putting uh, Sherwin-Williams Low Luster Duration on this stuff. Obviously, the sun and the rain never hit it. It's not going to be affected. It's beautiful, though. You could have just used flat. You could have just used whatever. You could even use an interior paint. It wouldn't affect it. This stuff will last a lifetime. You're only going to have to clean cobwebs off it. Another super interesting part of the project is this wall behind me here. This is all salvaged redwood. The client uh, tore down a barn. Saved all this super historic, uh, tight grain, uh, nearly defect free redwood, which is insane here because a lot of this stuff is shipped in from California and stuff. Probably 100 to 150 years old. Milled it all, installed it, and then I used some more duckback translucent on this stuff. And this stuff was super, super thirsty when we put it on. We applied the duckback by hand. You could just see it soak in there, and that stuff is going to last a long time. <laughs> A very long time. So let's go inside and I'll, show, I'll uh, run you through my interior coatings. <sighs> this place is insanely beautiful. It's an amazing, amazing project. So you see you come in here and the idea was light and bright and airy like this. Windows, doors, trim, everything here, all the woodwork and stuff made by the client. Some very interesting um, features of this too. The client made all these insanely beautiful cabinets. This is all quarter sawn white oak. Uh, one of the finest furniture woods ever known to man. Also one of my personal favorites. Uh, we used a, a, a satin uh, oil varnish on that there. Client made all the cabinets here. We have true divided light, double hung windows. So you can tell very intricate trim. All these windows, these muntins don't come off. These, these are true divided light windows. So we had to take all these double hung windows apart. We masked off the windows. Here, I'll kind of show you an example here. We masked off the windows from the outside to keep the elements out. This was in winter, mind you, in Northern Minnesota. We took all the sashes out, made racking on the inside, finished all of these uh, inside, and then reinstalled them here. So the coating schedule inside. Uh, oh, one last thing before we talk about coating schedule. Again, custom made bar, like here. Emerald trim urethane. I used a tinted primer underneath. Emerald trim urethane over the top. I sanded through, distressed the finish a bit. And then I rubbed in a little oil stain in the edges to give it a little age. And then I coated the entire thing with satin varnish. So again, decorative finishes, things like this. This is a 100 year finish right here. As long as people don't beat it up, it's an awesome, awesome finish. <sighs> okay. Joanne Fortin. Where are you? The town. Oh, this is in the wilderness in northern Minnesota. And to uh, keep my clients sort of anonymity, I just choose not to tell where they live. It's not a secret, but also no reason to, uh, no reason to blow up their spot, as they say. So let's talk about coding schedule. 
This project, all the coatings are listed below, but I'm going to explain a little bit about this. Ethos of the project, the clients want premium, they trust me. We have a long-standing relationship, and they basically said, give me the best. And so again, I walked up and down the Sherwin-Williams catalog. I worked closely with Sherwin-Williams on this one to say, what is the best stuff we can do? What is the coolest, most innovative stuff? At that time, emerald trimurethane was actually just being introduced to the market. And I told them, if, uh, if you want to try this out on a showcase home, I'll work with you, give you some feedback, things like that. We took a whole bunch of satin emerald trim urethane, and this was one of the first uh, first houses, new construction in the country to fully use emerald trim urethane on there. So we were experimenting. We used a combination of airless and air assisted airless uh, to spray all the finishes. Coating schedule goes as follows. All the drywall primed with Sherwin-Williams PVA primer after cleaning out all the dust. Uh, after that's dry, we actually pull sand and sand all the drywall down to get it nice and smooth clean up the dust again. Then we used Sherwin-Williams Cashmere Low Luster. Um, the reason I spec'd out Cashmere, now you would think, hey, ultra premium, you, you should have used you know, emerald wall paint, uh, you know, uh, duration wall paint, things like that. To me, premium or ultra premium doesn't always necessarily mean the most expensive. For those of you who have ever used Low Luster Cashmere, this stuff is greased lightning. It is truly cashmere. You can tell the difference with Sherwin-Williams cashmere, especially when you have new construction walls that have been sanded smooth. You put two coats of this stuff on, it glides on like grease lightning, goes on really easy, but the finish, the finish is insanely tactile, insanely beautiful. The only downside to cashmere is sometimes it doesn't cover as well, but what you gain from that is this finish that is almost unrivaled. Uh, Duration Home Matte is sort of my standard interior uh, repaint paint, and that's great. We use it on all our new construction too, but when I have the chance to massage all these walls, and I know these clients are going to take care of these walls, and use Cashmere Low Luster, the finish is unbelievable. Here, I'll see if I can't get a, uh, a sideways glance of this for you guys. Like, Look at that. That is, I know this video is not going to do it justice because I'm broadcasting from the middle of the wilderness, but this is like a piece of polished stone, all these walls. It's an amazing thing. Okay, so the walls. That's easy enough. Uh, Sherwin-Williams Cashmere Low Luster. Uh, super awesome product, often overlooked. Everybody loves cashmere, but rarely do people treat new construction with it because most new construction standards are so low. Ceiling is done with Sherwin-Williams CHB. Um, I know this might be a regional project uh, product. Now, you may think, well, this isn't their premium ceiling paint, or why didn't you use low, uh, cashmere on the ceilings? You don't want ceilings to be really, really light reflective. To me, you need a dead flat, and the deadest flat I can get, because you're never gonna touch them, is that CHB flat. It is a beautiful product. It's very inexpensive. It's actually sort of a new construction spec sort of product, but again, we're not going for premium in price. We're going for premium in effect and feel and look and use. And that is that. So what you don't want, the problem is with a project like this, you have two open dormers like this, and you have raking light across the ceiling. The drywallers did an amazing job on this product uh, project, but still drywall has flaws. And you do not want to be laying in your bed loft looking at you know a crease, a seam, a wobble, a something in the ceiling. So it's, it's an awesome product. It does what it needs to do. It gives you that light, lofty, airy feeling, and the effect between the low luster on the walls and the flat on the ceiling is almost none uh, because the colors are all the same. So it's, it's kind of a neat product. Let's see what questions we have here. Derek, very interesting to see this update. Get to see if Emerald is worth the insane cost. You know, one of the things too that, especially with a whole bunch of like rain refresh products coming out, and I think they're north of $100 a gallon, one thing I want to remind people is that in a project like this, you are going to spend tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars to complete the inside and outside of a project like this. 10 to 15% of this entire product, uh, project is going to be materials. So let's just say, thought experiment, the difference between buying my favorite ultra premium $75 to $100 a gallon of product, maybe, maybe some stuff a little bit less, or going with bargain basement $10 to $20 sort of new construction spec, is only gonna be the difference of a few percentage points on a project like this, truly. It's all your labor. So I know everybody fixates on the cost of a gallon of paint. On this, I'm looking at 500 labor hours at average cost 25 to $30 an hour. 
on this. That's the thing that I think about and, and the, the time it takes to get these ultra premium finishes and things like this in a house. So again, good to be mindful of your materials, but it should be a very small portion of a project like this. And what you get for another couple percentage points on a project like this, you go from having something that needs to be repainted in five years or possibly failing outside to having a hundred year finish if nothing messes with it. Obviously you have to maintain the outside stuff, but if nobody dents or nicks or marks up this wall or trim, this is it. This is the only finish for this house for the rest of its life, depending any weird usage. So, uh, Joanne, thank you very much. Uh, Derek Santa Cruz shirt, <laughs> former skater here. Uh, I did just get back from California and this is an actual Santa Cruz Santa Cruz shirt. So, uh, Jonathan, absolutely. Um, Dominic, ooh, Dominic Crowley from over, ah, I love Dominic's work. If you guys don't follow Dominic, uh, if you think what I do, it looks interesting, you need to follow Dominic. What's the maintenance life on the exterior oak shakes? Um, so I would, I would, if this were my house, I would recommend probably putting a refresher coat on every three to five years just to keep it up. Uh, my, my thinking, probably like yours, Dominic, is it's way easier to do small bits of maintenance, like oil changes in a car, than wait for the engine to blow up and do a complete overhaul. So for me, prepping things off, applying either by brush or by uh, spray, one more coat every three to five years will basically have this coating go indefinite. And I would say after two to three maintenance coats, you can maybe lax a little bit in it because you don't want to build too much of this stuff on either. It's a very thick product, very durable product. If you recode it every two years, eventually you'd actually put too much on and it would actually become a liability because it becomes uh, unstable and, the, and the, the coating, the multiple layers of coating would actually move differently than the wood. All right, so let's talk about the, the trim then. This is the showcase of the house. Again, client cut down trees. These clients are insane people and I love them. They have the similar ethos to me, which is if you're gonna do something, do it for a lifetime and enjoy it. And, and quality of aesthetics and, and finishes and things like that actually bring enjoyment to our life. There is a diminishing return to this. Like you can just put too much money and too much time into something where you don't get the reciprocal back, but these people have it dialed into, I'm going to put a lot of labor in to get something that people don't normally get, but it's going to last a lifetime and I'm gonna smile every time I look at it. The trim schedule on this one here, all handmade woodwork, hand milled, hand applied by, by some of the finest craftspeople around, including the client himself. Um, dusted everything off, shop vac, you know, the normal thing, patched all the holes, caulked all the cracks. And then we used Sherwin-Williams Easy Sand Oil Primer. And again, um, I'm still a fan of oil primer. There's a whole bunch of pine and other stuff included in, in a lot of this woodwork. And we had to stop those resinous knots and pitch and tannin coming through. So Easy Sand Oil is an insanely tough oil primer. Um, you have to put it on at a, at a pretty thick wet mill thickness in order for it to level off. It's a, uh, there's, there's tons and tons of, of what I would consider solids in it. It's a heavy, heavy oil primer. If you do a light coat, it can get gravelly. You kind of have to sand it off, which again isn't a big deal because it's easy sand. But if you put it on super thick and give it some uh, time to sort of like level out because it's wet, it goes insanely smooth. And all it takes is a one, two, three with a uh, scuff sander on it to get it smooth. And it truly is easy sand. Like if you, if you have ever used this stuff before, you know, bare piece of wood, really good coat of easy sand, let it dry overnight. You come back, you can sand that with minimal effort, glass smooth. And that's what we did to this. We spend all our time prepping. The top coats, <laughs> the top coats for emerald trim urethane, we did two top coats on all the trim, all the ceilings, doors, windows, everything, twice in a day. And, and more on that in a little bit. But the top coats on it, people think that, you know, when they think about doing a trim or a cabinet project like this, you think, oh my God, it's top coating all this woodwork. The top coat is almost an afterthought of all this stuff. It's all prep, it's 80% prep, and there's a little bit of fine finishing, spraying the trim enamel on at the end. That's all it is. What really caught my eye about this is we are probably four hours away from my, my house, straight north in, in uh, the wilderness of Minnesota, and I had a whole bunch of craftspeople with me. And if we were to use a standard hybrid top coat that has like a 16 hour recoat, what happens is it only took us about two hours, two and a half hours to spray all the trim and windows and doors and everything in this house once we were ready. I had two helpers moving lights, cords, filling my uh, sprayers up, and I basically just rocked and rolled. I just had that sprayer in one hand, maybe an ancillary light in the other just to see some spots. 
And if we used one of those traditional um, sort of hybrid coatings or even a regular oil enamel, we would have had to wait overnight uh, to do the second coat. Now, we're four hours away from our families and stuff like that, and everybody's on the payroll. What emerald trim urethane allowed us to do, and this was innovative at the time, we all take for granted that you can recoat, you know, these uh, hybrid finishes now in a few hours. We were able to do this entire house with a trim in one day, two coats, because it dried quicker. And we were able to sand it between coats, which is amazing, because that to me is the test of a good finish. Using oils or other hybrid finishes, we would have had to wait overnight. We would have been in the wilderness another day for three or four people. Now, again, when you're thinking about um, the cost of coatings, yes, emerald trim urethane, rain refresh, things like that are gonna be a little more expensive than a can of, you know, $18 an hour satin wall paint that you could have put on there. But it saved a day of labor for four to five people uh, in total through this. And then you think about the, the driving time and things like that. So again, good to pay attention to materials, but only to a point. If a couple, you know, the difference between, you know, an average, um, you know, maybe can of like a, just a standard satin latex enamel or an oil enamel, you know, you're probably looking, you know, 40, 45 bucks. Maybe emerald trim urethane is in the 70s. So you end up spending another 200 bucks on enamel for this house. You save a day of labor for four people. That is insane. It, you could have saved thousands of dollars on a project like this just by using a little more expensive coating. So that was the coating process here. The cabinets, you can see beautiful handmade cabinets here like that. Um, all Minwax products, Minwax stains, Minwax varnish, Minwax varnishes, things like that. Uh, awesome stuff. I've had, uh, I've used them for two decades. Uh, do great stuff. You can get them all at Sherwin Williams. It was a great compliment to this. Again, a nice low satin. Stain it. Bring out the fleck in the uh, in, in the medullary rays in in the quarter sawn oak, and then finish it well. Now the floor is something cool too. Again, all hand milled oak flooring like this. They cut down the trees, they milled the flooring, and they installed it. And this is a super sneaky product. Um, one of my favorite products and favorite product names uh, uh, for, that, for that matter is Fabulon. Fabulon is an awesome name and it's an awesome product. It's a satin, well, you can get it in satin or semi-gloss or gloss. It's a polyurethane made for floors. And uh, when I did my restoration on my 1917 home uh, in my hometown, I hand finished all of the floors in that house with three to four coats of that stuff. And my kids could not destroy it. It is one of the most beautiful, uh, not only beautiful, durable products that I've ever seen for floors like that. Again, it's it, it smells bad. Most good things do. But what you're left with is a finish that's just bomb proof. It, it's amazing. And sometimes what we do as craftspeople is we give up aesthetics in order for durability. We say, yeah, it doesn't look good, but it lasts forever. Who cares? This is not one of those things. Every, every product that I spec, including that Fabulon, not only looks the best, but I think is actually more durable than a lot of other things. So it's a great product, uh, project. Uh, Kane and Mole, I know you're watching here. I think you had a hand in this one too, uh, up in Northern Minnesota. We had a lot of fun here. So, all right, uh, let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, beach house painting. What's the best way to keep air safe and clean while spraying out with the oil primer? A big project cleaning up your sprayer after running it through. Oh yes. So this is something that, uh, actually fairly, uh, fairly unique. Uh, it, it used to be unique to our company. Now it's not much anymore, but we actually use homemade air scrubbers slash negative air machines, which basically is a monstrous fan. And we built a little box in front of this fan that has furnace filters in it that filters the air. And what we do is there's a super simple like geothermal um, uh, idea of like air movement, which is negative air pressure. So the idea is you want to evacuate the air in this house as quickly as you can to get rid of particles and smell. The way you don't do that is to seal this entire house up and get fans running inside because all that's going to do is make a cyclone inside and it's going to make a whole bunch of dust and, and the stuff's not going to escape. What we did was we used fans in the windows with furnace filters on them. We used negative air machines, these high pressure fans. What we would do then is go all the way to the top of the project and crack a window and put a filter in there and we bring in fresh air from outside and then we go to either the basement or the farthest way away and then we have one of our fans in a window but shooting out. Upstairs, fan shooting in. Downstairs, fan shooting out. You can do it likewise too, uh, as long as you have one, a far end of the project bringing in fresh air, 
a other end of the project, sucking that fresh air through the project and shooting it out a window. We like to filter both ends just because uh, we don't want stuff coming in from the outside. Like in northern Minnesota, you'll have pine pollen in the spring. You don't want to shoot a bunch of pine pollen into a house like this. Likewise, you also don't want to shoot a bunch of particles and stuff outside. So what we do is drag that air in, and what that does is it brings fresh air from outside, drags it through the project, it picks up odors uh, and particles. The, the particles get stuck in the filter, and then the air goes outside. You can actually evacuate the air in a house many times an hour, which is really cool. So when we get spraying, you can imagine, we use like, you know, I would imagine between six and nine gallons for one coat of emerald trim urethane. Imagine six to nine gallons within two hours getting sprayed all around here. Now, I have my air assisted airless and my airless um, really, really dialed in, so there's not a lot of overspray, but there's not zero overspray. So you always kind of have to pay attention to something like that. Um, cleaning up sprayers, too. So this is a big thing as well. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, basically, when you're done with oil primer, in my company, we uh, at this time, we used to have dedicated sprayers for oil and this. So I actually used a 15-year-old Graco pump that I bought from another painter. All we did was run oil primer for trim and cabinets through it. So we basically just left it in oil primer all the time. When we didn't, all we would do is get the oil primer out, run a bunch of mineral spirits through it just so you know it wouldn't freeze or, or dry up, and then just kind of leave it. Uh, and as long as you clean out the filter in the gun and the filter in the machine, you're going to get it real, real clean. Now, there's some people that like to have crystal clear spring water running out of their sprayers. That's a whole nother thing. Prepare for an hour or two of cleaning. You got to use super hot solvents. You got to continuously change out solvents doing this. You use a lot of hot chemicals and a lot of solvents and something like that for not really a great return. When I have to use a sprayer that goes from oil to that, basically you want to get all the oil primer or the oil out of it. You want to, I do like a double rinse. Uh, I do the initial rinse with uh, probably two quarts of mineral spirits, run it through. It shakes a bunch of stuff loose, not only in the hose, the gun, uh, but the machine as well, the siphon hoses like that. You change out that thinner, get two new quarts of thinner. At this time, I clean out all the filters, uh, knock everything out, get those crystal clear in a bucket, put those back in. And with the second thinner wash with two quarts of thinner, you'll see um, an immediate change. Like within 10 seconds of running it through the hose, you'll see it get already clear. To me, if you can get it barely milky, that's just fine. I mean, there, you're never going to get it perfectly clean without hours and hours and gallons and gallons of thinner. To me, that's okay. At that point, what I would do is evacuate all the thinner if we're going to a hybrid or a water-based coating. Evacuate the thinner, and I would run about a gallon of water through that. I don't like soap because you don't want to start introducing things that could be a uh, contaminant later, but I would run a gallon of water through in two phases. Again, the two quarts and the two quarts. Run two quarts of water through to kind of just knock a bunch of stuff loose. You'll see some bubbles of thinner and maybe oil in there. Get rid of that stuff, uh, reclaim it, whatever you recycle, whatever you do. Run another uh, two, two, uh, two quarts of water through. Again, you're not going to get it perfect, but it's pretty good. At this point, I would throw in my emerald trim urethane. You know you're not going to get 100% of the oil or the thinner out, but what I do is run, uh, once you get the emerald trim urethane or a water-based paint through it, um, I would run it for about five seconds after you get it all charged up, shoot about five seconds worth of product through the hose like that. And honestly, again, not perfect, but I've never had a paint failure switching out coatings and doing that multiple times a day. Yes, you will not get 100% of the oil, that other stuff out, but I've also never had a failure doing that. I've never then sprayed a water-based paint and all of a sudden had a whole bunch of fish eyes or things delaminated or failed or things like that. So um, that's that's just a data point for you. I'm sure if you read the uh, uh, you know technical data sheets, it's going to tell you something else. So Maro, my friend from this old house. Uh, bom dia, Maro. Good to see you. Um, okay, everybody. Besides that, I just thought I would give you an update. The trim looks absolutely amazing. Um, what I look for uh, in in failure on stuff like this is when you have windows in Minnesota like this, uh, a lot of the times because of the temperature differences, we have condensation on the windows and it gathers in these corners. And what you'll find is that, you know, some of the, some of the paint flakes off sometimes, uh, some of the, uh, you know, you get a little powdery mildew. This stuff is perfect. It's not even dirty. It's just amazing. So big window sills like this here, 
perfectly clean, no, uh, no effects. What I was really interested in is because the clients were using a whole bunch of uh, pine and uh, you know wood that they cut down from trees, where are we gonna get a whole bunch of those knot holes coming through? And honestly, I searched the entire house. I have not found a knot hole bleed through. So that's an amazing testament uh, to, the, to the blocking uh, potential of easy sand. Um, other than that, guys, uh, again, if you wanna join the PCA, the Paint, Painting Contractors Association, um, some of the finest craftspeople and business owner in the world are there. I would urge you to at least look into it. Um, there's a whole bunch of free resources there, including industry standards, which if you say, well, hey, what constitutes uh, a good wall? There was a discussion in, uh, I think, the Gathering of Minnesota Painters this morning where somebody had asked, when you have new construction, what is the standard that the drywaller should leave it at? Because I'm, I'm being told to paint this house and it doesn't look like the drywall is done. The PCA has free standards for you to say, if you can get all parties to agree on them, this is a standard of a substrate that's ready for paint. There's act, one of the coolest standards, if you use those standards for nothing else, there is a standard that actually says what a well-finished substrate is. It will dictate how far from the wall you will be, under what lighting circumstances, and under what sort of like magnification you can look at it, if any at all. So people always ask, the homeowner says this wasn't done well, I know I did well, there's a standard for that. So free stuff from the PCA, look into membership there. Lots of changes coming down the pike there as well. Uh, thank you to Sherwin-Williams for partnering with this. This house has been featured in multiple publications because of the innovative finishes, the unique approach. I started my business years ago because I love science, I love data, but I'm a history freak. I love, love, love historic stuff. I restored my own home with some of the most innovative, scientifically advanced coatings you can get. I got a chance to basically replicate a hundred year old house using the most innovative brand new, uh, brand new coatings. It was an awesome thing. I love it and it does pay off. It doesn't cost much more to do this than it does tracked new housing, except in five years you have to repaint all that tracked new housing and this stuff outside will have to be maintained inside. This is a hundred years depending on usage and that's what we're going after. I mean, this is something where I hope that this family looks at this decades and decades and decades later and says, it was worth it. It was really worth it. And when I go into historic homes, when I visit some of these museum houses that are open to the public, I see some of these wood finishes that are 140 years old and they look just like this stuff. That's a testament to the time and the thoughtfulness that craftspeople put in in the 1800s, which is insane. These people didn't even have a light to plug in and they can make a varnish piece of wood last 150 years. There is no excuse when it comes to it. With a little bit of thoughtfulness and a little bit of ingenuity, we can do the same thing for not much more either. So thank you everybody for watching. I'm gonna go back on family time here. Uh, the rest of the family is here and they're being very gracious to allow me to do this during some family time here. Uh, always good to see everybody here. Uh, I see some of my own people watching. I love this, Nathan Hutzel, Kanan, all this and that. Thank you guys, have a good weekend and we'll see you next week.